Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca and I'm a fish biologist and ichthyologist but also PhD student studying lower carid pleco catfishes and their evolution. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about researching and actually identifying uh, reliable sources for fish keeping. And this does differ depending what you're wanting to get out of fish keeping in general. If you're a beginner you might use different sources to, if you're trying to get a bit more of an advanced idea or maybe a more in-depth idea of a topic and this also depends on the fish you're keeping so there's a variety of websites and sources i'd recommend particularly and this really depends on what you're trying to get out of fish keeping in general um so the main one i'm going to go over a few quick like maybe ones if you're just starting out but that's not really the aim of the video so much and when you're starting out you want something that's very clear um very understandable, sort of maybe not so much in depth, opposed to if you were going to um, go a bit more in um, sort of scientific into a topic. So I'd recommend websites like Practical Fish Keeping, that's got years worth of information on different fishes, different styles of keeping, different people's setups. And it's got a whole scope of different things, so you can't really get bored of it. And I used to use it for years, uh, just searching up different topics and finding different things. It does have a magazine, and it can be really useful if you're just starting out and trying to understand what you want to keep, what, um, what styles of fish keeping you really enjoy. As an extension of that, I think that Seriously Fish is something, so you want... You've won the fish tank, um, practical fish keeping is really good for understanding aquarium keeping in general, but for the actual precise care of fish, then I would use Seriously Fish. Um, so both are websites, but practical fish keeping does have a magazine. Uh, TFH, uh, the website's okay, but the really large bits of text can be a bit overwhelming. And I don't actually tend to use it that much. So other than those i never i used to use a lot of forms um, the only issue i'd say with that is sort of take things with a pinch of salt and do your own research and this is for good and bad um there's plenty of good there's plenty of bad and it is a real learning curve to use different uh what was forms but now i guess it's facebook groups and stuff like that so then what about other styles of or getting more into depth with fish keeping looking at it in a more scientific view maybe you're wanting to keep certain fishes so this is really important i think if you're wanting to keep low carvids some fishes you can get away without so discus fishes i think you could get away without going so much into scientific depth of care because you're dealing with one species that's got common names it's got scientific names you can uh, it has got scientific names, but you can look them all up and you can get an idea of what you're keeping with, so with lower cards and quite a few other fishes. You need um, scientific papers, you need scientific resources because there isn't actually going to be information. Like sometimes there isn't actually information outside of papers or maybe you need scientific resources. So the first one I'd use is for understanding scientific names and actually obtaining the original descriptions of papers and this will give you the most up-to-date scientific names so this one is known as catalogue of fishes and this is a massive sort of search engine in a way but you search in the um, scientific name that you're wanting to um, look into and i recommend doing it occasionally especially um every year or so ideally because things do change but you'll see you'll type in the name and it'll give the current name so the currently accepted scientific name but it will also give um the references so these will be the original descriptions of who described it it will also give any papers that discuss why it's this species and maybe why it's not and this is actually more it's not just useful for descriptions and therefore identifying different fishes it's also useful because there might be aspects of care so especially for some fishes um for insistious ranunculus i found the scientific paper and then i looked at the scientific paper and it had tips on how to care for these fishes not so much in like it doesn't say this is how you care for it, but it says this is what they like in the wild this is what they might eat um this is how they socialize and for diets i think it's even more important 
But that resource is invaluable. It's totally free. The only issue is that some of the references you might need institutional access to access. I always recommend, even though it will, might give it access, uh, like how to get onto Google Scholar and stuff like that, web science or whatever, if you just plug it into Google, then um, you can mostly sometimes try and find it on ResearchGate and if you contact the scientist they might be able to send you a PDF of the paper particularly if it's of a lot of interest and the best ones I think are the revisions because they've got loads of species usually a taxonomic key and they're just really important if you're wanting to actually identify a species and start identifying ones that's how you can find some really rare gems just the fishes that you might not see sort of sold um, under the right name and it's just sort of there's no you can't even like this resource is just there's nothing like it for any other group of animals I don't think or even plants um, so you, it just gives you an up-to-date it gives you scientific descriptions at the end of the day and you can start identifying things um, and the revisions have keys so you can identify the different species and maybe if you think, oh, that's not quite like I think this species is, I'll look up the description and then you get, maybe it's a different species, maybe it could be undescribed, and then you can build an opinion on that. It will not use common names, um, it will only use scientific names. So the rest, it really depends. So another really important or useful resource is GBIF. This is a database and it is a hit and miss in areas um just where it um because it records based on whether it's in a collection um observations obviously observations can be a bit iffy so say so you might especially for some um fishes like hypostomus plecostomus you might see oh it's been seen in asia it probably hasn't because it actually hasn't been um imported it's probably a misidentification of Theopithecus um, or Theopithecus as a genus itself so sometimes there's a bit of a pinch of salt but it can give a really good idea of um, the geographical range of a species and also maybe where there's collections of it so I use because I use um, natural history museums um, catalog I know that not all fishes are actually listed on GBIF from there but also it lets me see where other collections might have specimens and where they might be recorded from. So that means that I can say that, yes, these museums, they're, they're caught from there, those specimens. But there's also some caught from there um, that does rely on identifications being correct. Uh, but that's the general issue with the website but it is really useful and it does give images so you can see wild images of the species um, and GBIF isn't just for fishes it's for everything so it's for plants um, I've used it a lot for different plants like Aloe and Monstera so um, but you can use it for almost everything so those two I use probably the most another one obviously I work with catfishes I used um, Planet Catfish. It does. It is a massive website, and it's only a small team working behind it. So there are some things are opinions, um, like Tyrophytes and a city being placed in Tyrophytes disjunctivus. Catalogue of fishes disagrees with that. I. It's a difficult um, situation. What uh, where to place that? Um, but it's a really useful resource for getting common names if you want to search something up because sometimes a lot of the English common names might probably won't come up with much but then you could try other common names and seeing whether that brings up a few things um, but species also finding the L number um, if you because if you have the scientific name you can use catalog of fishes uh, GBIF etc um, L number planet catfish will have it under the scientific name and also the LDA number and also whether it actually is that L number so take I think it's oh 67 I think it is it's either Canthicus hystrix but it gets listed as a Canthicus adenis a Canthicus adenis no that's what 155 I think 
and I can't because Adonis gets listed as 155 and 155 actually refers to Acanthicus hystrix, which is a different species, same genus. 67, I think, gets referred to Permacistus of Antiochus, but it actually refers to a Pseudancistus. But you'll find all of that on Planet Catfish, along with the, what's it, L144 being used for a common bristle nose variant, when natural 144 doesn't exist in the trade. And you can find loads of details on that. And also, sort of the history of identification and understanding Laurel cards. Another website, well, there's a few to back that up. So, Scott Cat is really good. Um, some of their um, articles are really interesting, especially of certain eras of certain fish you don't see anymore. Um, they've got really in depth articles on quite a few topics and I use a lot of them for references as well. If I'm struggling to find the original description, I might go on either of those two. Uh, the others, there's um, L Wells, that's good for sort of reading different techniques. Sometimes it's just looking for clues. And then I also look at scientific papers. Um, what else? Uh, Lawcarday.com, there's one I can't pronounce. I just have to find it on my thing, um, on my computer. Um, another website for Laurel Cards and Plex. Other websites, uh, research gates are useful for identifying and finding papers. So I use it all the time. The only issue is that you can't actually search up keywords if you're trying to extract something from a paper. You, um, you have to download it as a PDF. But it does give you access to be able to message really quickly a scientist, a scientist asking for the PDF of their paper. And I tend to use that. I tend to use Google to access it rather than searching on it because you get everything from people's um, like just random like things, what's it like, topics related to it, um, but not what you want to actual papers. Uh, Google Scholar can be quite useful for finding things. If I'm really like, I use a journal of fish biology a lot and I look at whatever paper comes up because it's really useful to get sort of you like scrolling down come up with a paper you're like I never thought of that before as a rabbit hole to go down so that's a really useful website and I think that's it I use on a daily basis and not even daily for some but the paper the websites that I would use to research and maybe the main topic I want to talk about or I'll try and talk about is that when you're researching a topic a lot of people will go straight onto aquarium websites and most of them don't reference their sources most of them I find are repeating the same information over and over again that are um, from other aquarium websites that have done the same and it just makes it so so many topics I think need researching a bit like better and maybe questioning because if you're getting your resources from someone else that's got their resources um, from someone else but there's no actual referencing there's no actual research done or the research is really dodgy or like not reliable then I think it just makes it so so many topics in hobby I think really need researching further. Diets are a big one for me. Um, other aspects of water parameters, a lot of people are copying. Sometimes it's, there's a lot of things when you're look, researching. Remember there's confirmation bars. Is, are you researching and then you're only accepting a resource that agrees with what you already think is true? So sometimes you have to really th maybe use it for rabbit holes to question what you're keeping and how you're keeping fish. Also, I think confirmation bias, uh, what's it? That's the one I was, oh. ah, think about correlation versus causation. Um, research it yourself because I'm really bad at explaining it. But that's a big thing with websites where a lot of them will build a correlate. But say something causes something when it's just a correlation rather than one that thing's causing that thing, it's just a correlation happening at the same time. Another thing is just because it's natural or natural doesn't mean it's good. So um, always think about 
for example, formaldehydes uh, and formalin, I think, are natural. But it doesn't mean they're good for you or the fish. It doesn't mean they're actually bad for you. And it depends on the circumstance. Don't just rely on one resource. One resource being one person. Everyone, everyone has a bias. Everyone could be misleading. Everyone has an agenda of some kind. Uh, the big agenda for me is if people are making money out of it, if people are becoming um, trying to get some popularity out of it, that can be a big thing. And just go down rabbit holes, enjoy yourself, make sure you find something that questions what you think is true and is reliable about it. Don't just use, so I don't actually use aquarium websites to find much stuff. I do enjoy certain, uh, there's a, I miss that style of fish keeping. I remember in the past when I could use certain websites and it was all new. So I do try and find that sometimes. But I think eventually they're all repeating the same thing. And a lot of websites are built by people that maybe they are interested in a certain type of fish, but they're writing about fishes they don't know about. And this is or topics they don't know about and it's getting so um it's a sort of you've got to be very careful especially scientists you keep in your field i don't like even though i've been researching with basic because i'm not going to do a video about them i might i guess i could but only within certain realms of it i don't really either want to go into um sort of what was it like the nitrogen cycle and stuff like that because I don't think someone so people like that I would rather have uh what's it Dr Tims who's done uh the products but also has papers on the topic he's done a lot of research I think that's sort of a topic I'd rather leave to someone who actually has a lot of research a lot of experience a lot of understanding and scientific fields are really niche so I like to keep to the fish themselves, mostly morphology, aspects of diet, um, and also fish keeping. So I'm not afraid of the nitrogen cycle. It's just I'd rather not go in depth to it. And fish keeping, I'm happy to do because, but it there is a lot of it. Just remember, like I think it's not. It's not being honest if you're really enthusiastic about this fish and then you're kind of giving information about one you don't actually know as much about or you might be misinterpreting, misunderstanding. And I say it all the time about plecos. There's hundreds of things about plecos. Firstly, they have misidentified the fish they've got a photo of. They say hypospis plecostomus is the most common and it's a Tereoplicthes. I've seen... Um, Panax listed as hypostomus plecostomus. Um, the diet's completely wrong. The uh, so many aspects, and I think it's also being realistic about what level of information you're giving. And don't say that these fish are easy when you probably haven't, maybe not kept them that long. You might have, because uh, ease is really difficult to work out but i think it's just being realistic being honest and keeping to what you know if you're going to give information it's just so that's kind of talk about websites anyone giving information references what's wrong with finding a few references and be careful because not all sources that use references are reliable no sources are actually reading their references which it is a lot to read through a paper i i if you notice i reference a lot of the same papers because mostly they're the main papers of the topic but i know they're relevant um and then the rest it will depend what i'm extracting from the paper but i think i'll, I'll end this now um Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, please comment, like and subscribe and goodbye.